a round of applause for the worship team this morning. Take a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming to church this morning. I, I believe that God's going to speak this morning, and God wants to speak to each and every one of you this morning. And I believe we're here in the right place as the youth go out. Uh, my youth are staying in. I do want the youth to be with us today. Uh, I believe that God's going to speak. How's everyone doing this morning? We're doing well. Have we changed our clocks this morning? Did anyone else get confused with the clocks this morning? Yeah, a couple I did, that's for sure. Guys, just want to thank each and every one of you for coming this morning. And thank you for your encouragement. Uh, I just love that we're an encouraging, we're a loving church. We just love each other. That's what I love about Gateway. I still remember when I first came uh, to Gateway, I got about 33 hugs at the door. And I hadn't walked into the place yet. Now, if we did that now, there'd probably be people in trouble, like people hugging but we're a loving church. And, you know, when I came up for the first time to speak, I remember Jeremy asked me to share the announcements. He gives me the microphone and I just started screaming off the top, not making any sense. And everyone's like, Josh, you did so great. Well done. I'm like, really? Dad's like, you actually made no sense, son. Uh, maybe you got to work and go to Bible college. And that was my first experience. And I've been so hanging to preach the word this morning. And it's interesting. I've got it written on my notes. It's not about me. And I've made sure to write that because sometimes we get in our own emotion and feeling. And I want to make this about God's word because God's word speaks, it ministers, it's sharp and active. It's sharp enough to cut between bone and marrow. God's word It's not about me, it's about Jesus. And I, for those who know me, I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about youth. And I really believe at Gateway Church, the youth are going to flourish, they're going to grow, and they're going to be the one that's going to minister in the future. It's the kids. That's why I want the kids here this morning. But I'm going to allow God to speak. And if you are here wanting to hear from God, today is your day. And if you are new this morning, I want to welcome you. You're in the right place. God is speaking this morning. I'm going to read from chapter 7 of Nehemiah. Now, for those who've never heard about Nehemiah, it's okay. I didn't know much about Nehemiah either. Before I knew about Nehemiah, I just knew he was short. Hence his name, Nehemiah. That's a joke. Jackie thought that was funny, by the way. But I didn't know much about it. But as you study Nehemiah, you really start to see that there are some spiritual principles that we can take. Will you read the word with me this morning, church? After the wall had been rebuilt and I set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Leviites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanai, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity. Integrity, hold that thought, and feared God. Feared God more than most people do. Next slide. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their houses. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it. And the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God, hold this, put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found. The title of my message this morning, it's time to build, it's time to set things right. It's time to build, it's time to set things right. Will you pray with me, church? Dear Lord, we just want to invite you to preach and speak through me, Lord. I pray your Holy Spirit just anoint this house. Lord, I pray it won't be my words, but it will be your words that penetrate and flow this morning. I pray you speak to our hearts. And Lord, I don't want to speak on my feeling or emotion. I pray that your word speaks for itself. I pray, Lord, you just be with us this morning. Bless and encourage each and every one and keep our hearts open for what you might want to bring. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. So church, a bit of an overview. If you haven't been here, uh, we've been talking about building. Now, we've been talking through Nehemiah about building, spiritual building. Now, remember that spiritual building is a metaphor. We want to build spiritually in our life. We want to build spiritually in our marriages. We want to build spiritually. And a part of building spiritually is that we've got to be on board and the reason why we want to build spiritually, it's in our mission statement, because we want to advance God's kingdom because we're biblically based, spirit-led, and exist to see God's kingdom advance. And as Christians, we want to build. 
we want to get better. We want to grow in faith and serve the Lord. We want to do better. And for those who don't know Nehemiah, he was a man after God's own heart. And if you know nothing about Nehemiah this morning, I've got four very simple, practical points from Nehemiah chapter 7 that I think that we're going to like, and I'm confident that God's going to speak. Now, my first point this morning, I get this from verse 1, is it says, Now it came to pass when the wall was built, and I set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. If we are to build spiritually, church, we must worship. Worship. I, I just love this worship. Why did he appoint the worshippers? He appoints the gatekeepers. Jeremy preached so well. He appoints the gatekeepers, the door uh, guards, but now he's appointing worshippers. And I really started to get confused and like, Lord, what's the, what's the point? What are you saying in this? Now, as you study Nehemiah, you would learn that there was a constant cycle of sin. There was rebellion taking place. God would often raise up prophets and king and, and kings to help them with their sin. They were rebelling and they were worshipping false gods. Did you know even in the temple, in the holy place, the priests were sacrificing to false gods? In God's temple. And Nehemiah now is a point. He's a man after God's own heart. He rebuilds the wall, but notice he didn't celebrate. He put worshippers. He put doorkeepers. It wasn't a time to worship. It was time to protect. And it's interesting that sometimes we want to celebrate when we get the victory. We want to, we want to praise God, we get the victory. But sometimes when we praise too much, we get distracted. And Nehemiah knew that if he didn't put the walls in place, the same recycle of sin would happen again. He was dealing with the sin. It's not enough church to build the wall. Now we have to protect the wall. We're seeing a discourse take place from the wall being built. We know about the Sam Ballots and the Tobias. And they were trying to distract Nehemiah from building. And I'm just going to say this, church, what I've loved about Nehemiah so far, whenever you want to build spiritually, there's going to be opposition. Whenever you try to grow spiritually, there's always going to be someone to drag you down, pull you back. It's three steps forward. It's one step back. Who has that? Church, this is spiritual. Nehemiah knew that there would be distractions, but he kept on building. He was advancing God's kingdom. He wanted to see the kingdom grow. And a part of growing, he had to protect it now. And I love this, worshippers, worshippers. See, the priest would offer sacrifices to Baal in the temple, and he was breaking this cycle. He was putting the right people in place. The point, church, is that we can't get complacent. We have to set things right. If we are to build spiritually, we have to set things right. I love this about the worshippers. Get this. I was studying this word worship. I was, I just, something was in this. Worshippers would often go around the temple and they would sing praise and give God glory all day long, all night long. Like they didn't stop. They just kept on worshipping. And if they got tired, they get beaten. Man, if I asked Joel, I asked him one day to come to our revival and sing three songs. I'm like, bro, what? Three songs? Come on, bro. But this was the passion. I love the worship in this house. I love passionate worshiping. I believe that Nehemiah was setting a culture for worship. It's interesting. Worshippers were also to act as guards. Isn't that amazing? They weren't just to worship. They were to act as guards. And this is interesting. Now, forgive me. Every time I say a Greek word, I get in trouble after and if you're Greek, you know, every Greek says everything's a Greek name. By the way, everything's a Greek. The chair, it's a Greek. Uh, the wall, that's a Greek wall. That's what Greeks are like. Forgive me. But this word worship, I studied it in the Greek. It's a word called proskonotas. And uh, I'll say it again. Is that right? Proskonotas. It's a Greek word. It means to adore or fall face down and worship. Get this even better. It's getting good. Worship is a posture. That's what the Greek meaning means. We remember that the Greek has the original meaning. And what they would do is they would translate the Hebrew into Greek and they would capture the heart of the word. Worship is a posture. And I believe that Nehemiah was setting a worshiping culture. He was setting things right. They were worshiping false gods. Now it's time to worship the one God. If we're going to passionately move spiritually and build into God's kingdom, we have to worship. And the, the more I think about and read this passage, the more it opens up. It's interesting, this word worship, mentioned 8,000 times. 8, 
thousand times in this context. So Nehemiah was setting things right. Church, we can't go the way it was before. We've got to keep worshiping. And my youth that are in here at the moment, the reason why we worship is because we give God glory because he saved us. He saved us. He saved the Israelites back in Egypt. He freed them out of captivity. He brought them into the promised land. And they praise God. Forget this, it gets better. Next slide here. We go to the next slide. Two Chronicles. It says, It came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were at one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And get this, they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music. And they praise the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures. Get this, this is the kicker. Then the house was filled with a cloud. Then the house was filled with God's glory. I'm here to tell you today that when we praise, God's anointing comes through. When we praise, we worship, he comes through. When you keep praising God, the glory fills the house. His presence is through worship. We have to set things right, church. I also want to teach us this morning that worship is not just about song. Worship is our warfare. Your worship is your warfare. That's how we fight our battles. It's through worship. Worship. I love this story in 2 Chronicles 20. We learn that the king was about to fight an immense battle. They had no weapons. They were to fight a battle in the army of the Moabites. They were waiting to destroy the Israelite camp. God says to the king Jehoshaphat, I want you to go down, but this time I want you to do something different. I want you to send the singers, the musicians, the the praisers to go down and sing. And I want you to sing in a loud voice. You know what they sang? For his mercy endures forever and ever. They kept on screaming. They kept on praising. You know what happened? It sent fear into the enemy camp and they ran in fear. I'm here to tell you today that your worship is also a part of your warfare. If we are to build spiritually, we have to keep on worshipping. Church also, what I found interesting about worship is the walls of Jericho. God told Joshua to send the the Levites, the priests around. And what I want you to do is I want you to sing at at a really loud voice, singing praise and mercy and endures forever. You know what happened? Walls came down. You know what it was? It was because of the worship. Paul and Silas in Acts 16, they were in chains. You know what broke the chains? Worship. So church, we need to be a passionate worshiping church if we are going to continue to build spiritually. We've got to set it right. We've got to worship the right God. Come on, who's with me this morning? Worship this morning. Do we worship God in our life? When's the last time we fell face down for the glory of God? Worship. Nehemiah appointed singers and worshippers because God responds to our praise. It's our weapon against the enemy stronghold. 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in pulling down strongholds. It is our warfare. And kids, when you're going through a season and you're doubting and you're worrying, just, just thank God. My youth that are here today, when you're going through a season of doubt, praise God because he comes through. He loves you. And it's the same thing for us this morning. Church, we've got to praise the Lord. The second point that I found in the next slide, to build spiritually, we must have godly character. And I get this from the next verse, that I gave my brother Hananiah and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and he feared God above many. I remember um, when I first came to Gateway, Jeremy's a leader. I'm going to put him on the spot, right? Jeremy's a leader. And I remember when me and Jeremy sat down and I came to the first time at church and he's like, bro, just tell me what you're good at. You know, he's 10 step ahead. We had a coffee the other day. It's 2020. When I sit with Jeremy, I feel like we're in 2040. That's just the, the, the grace that's on that guy. He's a leader. And anyway, I remember late at night, he texts me and goes, bro, what are you good at? I said, oh, I try to think to myself, what am I good at? He goes, can, can you worship? And I'm like, oh, can I, can I worship? Can you, can, can you sing? I said, oh, really? I sing in the shower. I, I do all that because, oh, okay. And then he asked me, he sent me another text. You probably don't remember. He sent me another text. He said, uh, can, you, can you play an instrument? Oh, I know I can clap off beat at church. I often do that at church. I clap off beat. And he's like, oh, that's okay. He's like, oh, bro, can, can, can you do administration? I'm like, definitely can't do administration. You get me to spell something, I will spell it wrong. I, I, I will spell it wrong. <laughs> 
And then he, then he asked me, he goes, bro, can you build? Can you build? Bro, you want me to build? I'll build it into my, na- into my hand. Like, I, I can't build. But I love this. This is the, what I love about Jeremy and his leadership. He sends me a text back. I was discouraged, thought I'm going to get sacked. I haven't even started a church yet. I thought I was going to get sacked. I'm like, bro, I'm not going to eat. Man. Okay. And he goes, bro, you know what he said? Welcome to the team. We, we can't wait to have you. And I'm like, what? I thought I was going to get sacked. The point of that is church. Give me a sec. The point of that story is, I'm going to get there. This is what the leader Jeremy is, right? Come on, give him a round of applause. The point of that story, church, is that we don't get selected based on our ability. And if it was due to ability, I would be in trouble. It's not about what I can do. It's about who I know, right? So it's not about my, it's not about my ability. It's your heart. And I'm going to tell you this. Your uh, godly character outweighs your ability, right? God will use you not because of what you can do, because he's already done it, right? So it's the cross. He's, he's done it for us. We're justified not by, by works, but rather through grace, by faith alone in Christ alone. So he's done the work. And I love this, that Nehemiah was selected. Uh, he selected his brother Hanai based on faithfulness. And that excites me because I don't have a lot of abilities. I can't build. I can't do a lot of worshiping. But I know I've got a heart. You get me to rock up somewhere, I'm going to rock up. You want me to stay late? I'll stay late. But the point of this story is that he chose his brother. Now, what was he doing? Hanani was mentioned by Jeremy in verse uh, in chapter 1, in verse 1. He gave the report. He's the one that gave the report to Nehemiah, right? And now we go from chapter 1 to chapter 7, and he gets promoted. What was he doing? I'm going to tell you what he was doing. He was serving. He was building. He didn't worry about the hearsayers. He was faithful. He knew what his job was to do. And that's for us, church. If you've got a heart, God will promote you. Don't worry about sorting it all out. Maybe you don't have a job right now. God will sort it out because he wants your heart. He wants your heart. And as I studied this word, his name, Hanai. Hanai, his name. You know what it means? Get this, church. His name in Hebrew means God has grafted me in. Isn't that amazing? I'm like, what? By grace. Doesn't that remind you of something, church? We've been grafted in. By grace, God's grace. He saved us. He set us free. It's by grace. And that's what I think this is the word for the church. It's that you don't have to be intellectual. You don't have to know all your scriptures. You don't have to have degrees, but you do need to have a heart. And he chose him based on faith. It's interesting, this word faith. So often we've, we've basically made this a, a dirty word, faith. And, and I'll tell you what I mean. We've been raising up kids. We've been raising up children to tell them all you have to do is just have faith. All you need to do is just come up and give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be okay. And what the what I'm trying to say is for us kids, there, there, there is a requirement. If you've got faith, Hanani used his faith. He was faithful. The enemy believes in God. He, he believes, he has faith that there's a God, but Hanani was faithful. Are you faithful, church? If we're going to build spiritually, we must have a godly character. If we are to grow spiritually in this season, it's about your heart. It's not about what you can do. It's about what's been done. And the second thing I noticed about this in verse, if we want to put it back, have a look what he says. And he feared God. Uh, In the the Hebrew, it's interesting. In the Hebrew, the, the word fear means to acknowledge. Isn't that amazing? So when you fear something, you're acknowledging something. And right, remember when we worship, we put a posture before God. Fearing is not about being scared. Kids, youth, it's not about being scared. What, 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 what that means is that you're acknowledging God. See, when we fear God more, we start to care less what people think about us. When we fear God, our problems are still there, but they start to diminish and he starts to increase. And that's the process of fearing God. And I messaged my dad and we we're talking about this and, he said something so profound. He goes, son, don't worry about fearing. We don't have to be scared as Christians. We used to be like that before we met God. People are scared. But we're scared to live without him. That's what we're scared. We don't. He's like a breathing apparatus. We've got to continue to breathe God. Adonai, he was selected because he was 
fearful of God. Church, I'm going to say this this morning. We've got to set things right. We can't keep fearing the enemy and his tactics. Nehemiah kept on building. Tobiah and Sam Bella, they did everything. They distracted him. They tried to send fear. And you know what? He kept worshipping. He kept building. He didn't get distracted because he knew no, he feared God more than he feared the enemy. And I love this, that, that he's got, they were building. They kept on building and worshipping. They had a sword on the other hand. They kept on building. It's enemy, you can't get to me. I have a job to do. I have a purpose and I have a plan because I know that through my worship and through my character that I'm going to see this wall complete. And the word for us today is we got to grow and continue to have a godly character. We need to start praying for God-fearing leaders in our governments. We need to start praying for shop assistants, God-fearing, faithful shop assistants. Every time I buy clothes, they're always extra small. I'm like, tell me what I'm really doing. Just joking, it's a bit of humor. We need to pray for teachers that are God-fearing, Sunday school leaders. I'm looking to build a team for Sunday school, and I'm not looking for how much scripture you know. I'm not looking for what you can do. I'm looking for your heart. And if you want to help kids, it's about your heart. It's not about what you can do. It's about God-fearing. We've got to keep serving and worshipping. We need to start praying for God-fearing, faithful people to lead our nation. The truth is the church has become more fearful than it has faithful. We would agree with me. We've we, we become more fearful because we've stopped fearing God. We've stopped adoring God and taking a posture before God. We've got complacent. We've got distracted. And Nehemiah knew that he had to put people that fear God more than fear man, right? And it's the same thing, this coronavirus has, I read a report over 52 pastors in America, 52,000 pastors were fearful in that season. These are people leading the church. And I get that we have to go and um, appreciate what is going on. But we need to fear God more than we fear anything else because that is how we grow our character. It's fearing God. That's what I want to say this morning. Church gets better. There is three ways. I want, to, I want to say this. There are three ways, and especially for my kids, this is what I want you to know. There are three ways that you can develop faith. Though. It's on the screen. The first is start with and don't neglect the small things. You might be young. You might think that you don't know enough. You might think that what you have is only little and you don't know a lot about God and about Jesus. But believe me that God values your heart. And it's interesting Rocking up to church, rocking up to church on a Sunday, small thing. Worshipping at church, rocking up, being consistent. The truth is we want financial breakthrough in our marriages, but we don't give to the church. The truth is we want youth ministries and ministries. We want to be youth leaders and leaders in the church, but we don't want to do the small things. We've we, we got to set some priorities straight. We've got to set things right. See, I love this. It says here, Luke 16, 10, you know what it says? Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. Church, we've got to get our priorities straight. It's the small things that matter. It's the consistency. It's the rocking up the church. It's the serving. It's the growing. It's the financial giving because we know that we fear God and we know our destination. That's why we be consistent. The second, I love this. Keep your relationship priorities straight. Church, our relationship to Jesus is the most critical. We must put Jesus first in our lives. You know, some Christians I know would rather watch The Bachelor than spend time with Jesus. Point number three, up on the screen, learn to use your time more effectively. Nehemiah spent only 52 days rebuilding the wall. Imagine if he spent his time being distracted by the hearsayers. I had a conversation with some Christians a few weeks ago and we were talking about a show called Gogglebox. Has anyone seen a show called Gogglebox? No? Anyone seen a show called The Bachelor? Please don't watch it. Anyway, so I'm talking about this show and they started to rattle off, these are Christians, rattle off all the names of The Bachelor and all the names of the Gogglebox and they're going on and on. I'm like, bro, well, well done. And then amazing that we started to talk about God. And you know what? They had nothing to say. The truth is, their time has been used ineffectively. We've got to set things right, church. We've got to know more about God than we do about the goggle box. Come on, are you with me? 
Like it doesn't matter what you see, it's about God and his truth and his word and his glory. Truth is, church, whatever you spend the most time doing, you can see what your heart is. The enemy works through fear. Nehemiah had every right to be fearful, but he trusted God and he had the right perspective. Church on the screen there, next slide, Matthew 10, 28. It says, do not be, uh, and fear not which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We're going to set some things right, church. If we're going to build spiritually, we need a godly character. Paul in chains in Philippi, we did a series on the right perspective. Remember that series? Paul had the right perspective. He knew that it wasn't about the chains. He knew his destination. He said to live is to die and to die is to gain. He knew because he had the right perspective. Church, we've got to set things right in our character. They're with me, church. Proverbs says the fear of man brings a snare, a trap. The enemy wants to trap you with fear. But I'm telling you today that if you, if you fear God more than you fear man, you'll get through. You're with me, church. Point number three. This is getting, we're going to get close to it. Stick with me. If we are to build spiritually, we must stay on guard. And I get this from verse three. It says, and I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Get this, everyone in his watch, everyone and everyone to be over and against his house. Church, me and Jackie, those of you who know, I'm, 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 we're trying to build a life. We're, we're trying to get married one day. We're talking about the future. And we're going to this process of talking through and we're butting heads a little bit in some areas. In, in a good way. It's a healthy thing, right? So we're, we're talking about the future. And I'm like, I want a dog. And she's like, I don't want a dog. They're, they're smelly. You're not going to clean it. Everyone's the same. They always say that. And I'm like, no, I really want a dog. And she's like, no. Nah. And we're biting heads, right? But it's interesting. It reminded me of my dog. I used to have this little dog called Diesel. He was this little Pomeranian. I used to, I, I know. I, I, my friends used to call him Demon. Like, he was crazy, right? But anyway, I used to have this dog. And it was interesting. He used to have this, you know, Schmackos. The dog, the Schmackos. So he used to love his Schmacko. And when my friends would come over, he would actually go and toy with them. So we have this barbecue outside uh, in my backyard uh, when I had my house. And there was this little groove under the barbecue. So my little dog, Diesel, goes under the barbecue and he puts his schmacko there. And he always does this. And anyway, when my friends would walk past having a good time and having a barbecue, everyone's you know, having a great time. And he runs out the barbecue and he grabs their leg. And, he did, and everyone's like, what's that? And then he'd go back and he'd just toy with people, right? Like if you came near me, uh, he, I would hold him in my hands. He was so cute. But you get near me, get her, right? And and he would do this. I'd sleep on the bed with him sometimes, and he'd sleep near my leg, and he'd have his schmacko there. And if I got near his leg, he'd bite my leg. Get off, get off me. What I'm trying to say, church, is that we've got to be vicious like this in our faith. We've got to be vicious. Come on, church. Come on. Who wants to be vicious for their faith? That's a little line. Watchman. Church, it's interesting. Did you know that watchman, I did this word, watchman, I started to research. And you know this word, what, what, what it meant was it's a guard. Like they were, you think we're, they're vicious. And what the point of that is they had to be vicious because they had to protect the city. They couldn't let corruption come into the city. Because if they let corruption, the same cycle of sin would happen again. Nehemiah was setting things right. And they appointed watches over the city. It's interesting, or another translation, porters. Look at this. They would walk around the city all day long and around the temple. And if they saw someone falling, like, um, sorry, if they saw someone there that were praising God, they'd bring peace. Look at this. But if they fell asleep near the temple, you know what they do? They would actually light them on fire. They would literally light them on fire. Can you imagine if we had people falling asleep in Jeremy's message, light them on fire? Can you imagine if we did? I know he preaches long, but brother, you preach well. Come on, bro. I learn from you, bro. I imagine we were like, that's how serious it was. Gatekeep, watchers. We gotta watch what we do. We gotta watch who we let into our lives. If we're gonna build spiritually, we must stay on guard. We've got to stay on guard. We have to stay on God. 
through warning and prayer, watchmen seek to keep the city from suffering the the ravaging effects of Satan, our spiritual enemy. Church, we've got to guard our hearts. We've got to guard our minds. The Bible says, above all else, guard your hearts. Truth is, I've got friends that have come to this church and confessed their life to Jesus. Three or four of my friends, and they started to let the wrong people in their heart. A few weeks, three months later, they're okay, they don't need God. I said to my friend the other day, what about your salvation? He goes, bro, God will let me in. I said, bro, read your Bible. Because if you don't guard your heart, you've got to be careful who you let into your house. The word house in the Greek is okios. And this Greek word, it means a, a family or a legacy. You've got to protect your fr- youth. We've got to protect who we hang out with. We can't allow our, our, our friends to bring us down. We've got to protect our hearts. We've got to protect who we give our time to. We've got to set things right, church. We have to set who we let into our hearts because that will corrupt your heart. We've got to be protecting. We've got to be vicious. God has given you something. It's not enough to celebrate now. Now it's time to stand on guard. Is there anyone in this house that wants to stand on guard? We've got to protect what God has given us. We've got to protect what is established. We've got to stand on guard. Nehemiah appointed watchmen over the city. And you know what he says? We go back to that verse. Look what it says. It says, everyone in his watch and everyone be over against his house. That's for all of us, church. We've got to watch you with that into our house. We've got to watch who we're letting in, church, into our hearts. And most of all, watch what we put in our minds. You know, the more stuff you feed your mind, the more we start to move away from the promise of God because we get distracted. And get this, church, the enemy wants you distracted. He wants you distracted. He wants you celebrating. Why? Because we can sneak in. He wants to sneak in. That's his sneaky. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we've got to be on guard. We've got to put the enemy on notice. That's why it says 1 Peter 5.8. Go to the screen. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walketh around seeking whom he may devour. Church, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in pulling down strongholds. The enemy is trying to put a stronghold over you, who you let in. My friends are out of church. They're in the enemy's camp because they didn't protect what God had given them. Protect it. Be vicious. Church, if we're going to build spiritually, we need to stay on guard. You're with me, church. You have two options this morning. Access granted. Access denied. Church, what are you allowing access into your life? Who have you been letting in that you shouldn't? And that's up to the Holy Spirit to convict you of that. But the point is that we've got to stand on guard. We've got to continue to trust and protect. If only we would stop giving the wrong access to the wrong people, the wrong TV shows. The truth is we give access to all the wrong things. Our young people are giving their bodies access to the enemy. The media is giving access to the enemy. We are allowing the enemy to access our lives by not being watchful. For any single people in the room, your sexual purity is the most important thing. Your sexual purity is God-given. It's a gift. Young people in this room, if you are single, appreciate that because God has a plan. And your sexual purity is how we worship God. It's going to happen. And I know that we don't talk about this a lot, but for my young people, it is a good thing. Guard your hearts, guard your minds, and protect what God has given us. With me, church. My last point. If we are to build spiritually, we must be obedient. The worship team wants to come. I get this from verse 5. So God put into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found. It's so interesting, church, that as we read the Bible, sometimes we tend to skip over names. We tend to skip over things because we think they're not important. And it's interesting, as you study this more and more, God put it into Nehemiah's heart. And I was thinking to myself, what? that doesn't even make sense. God, like, you don't, like, what, what does it mean? Like, I don't get it. And Nehemiah not only rebuilt the wall, he kept on worshipping. He guarded, he guarded by protecting the city and the walls. And as you read the genealogy, I think it's important to remember, if it's important to God, it's important for us. It's our purpose. And when God puts something on your heart, 
into purpose. And if it makes no sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes when God puts something on your heart, it doesn't add up. It doesn't seem normal. The names were recorded. didn't seem normal. But Nehemiah knew he had a heart for God. He worshipped God. He protected what God had given him. He stood on guard and he continued to be obedient. Church, there are a lot of theological understandings I can give you this morning. But what I do want to say this is when God says something, it's his purpose. It's his purpose. He wants you here. It's his purpose. Maybe God's speaking to your heart this morning about something that might seem uh, not natural. It doesn't make sense. How am I going to do it? But believe me, when God records it, there's a purpose. And when God has numbered every hair of your head and named you by name, there's a purpose. And he didn't want to get this. He didn't want the corruption to take place. He was breaking the cycle of sin. He couldn't have the same corruption take place. Nehemiah set things right. And I want to close with this. In a moment, we're going to open up prayer. We're going to do one worship song. And then if something's on your heart this morning, if something God has put in your heart, just get prayer. Let's not give the enemy a foothold any longer. Let's put the enemy on notice with our worship. Let's put the enemy on notice that we're going to keep trusting God, even if it doesn't make sense. I finished with this church. I remember making a tough decision. I remember I was driving around and around. I was at my job. I was so unhappy. I was so unhappy because I knew I wasn't responding to what God had put in my heart. He told me, Josh, I want you to leave your job. It didn't seem normal. It didn't seem natural. I'm like, how am I going to do it? I don't have any money. I, I gotta, I, I've got everything I need. I'm comfortable. And God's like, I want you to leave your job. Nothing, church. And remember, Jeremy was assisting me in that process, and I wasn't growing spiritually. I wasn't growing, I wasn't building because I kept uh, denying what God had put in my heart. And I came to this place where I'm like, I can't do it anymore, God. If, if this is from you, I'm like, God, I need you to come through. I, I promise I'll do it, but I need you to come through. A few weeks later, I made the decision to leave my job. We had our first leadership meeting with Heather and the team and Jeremy and Joel and, and Barry. We had our leadership meeting and I was so discouraged. because I didn't tell them that, but I was hurting. I don't, I, I don't have a job. I'm going to pay my bills. How am I going to get married? I want to do these things. God, what does it mean? I remember Jeremy hands me an envelope and there was a note in the envelope. Whoever this was, if it was here, I just want to thank you. But God knew that he was going to see it through. He put a note saying, Josh, I, I know that you might have needed this, but here's some money to help you get through this next stage. It was over $1,000, but it's not about the money. The point is that it's about the purpose. When God has a plan, he's going to see it through. When God has a plan, he's going to see it through. So I encourage you this morning, church, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're whatever it is, when God puts something on your heart, he's going to see it through. I want to leave you with this. Worship God. Worship God in spirit and in truth, and I promise he'll come through. Watch your heart. Guard your heart. Be obedient to what God has placed, and I promise you that God will see it through. Church, I love you, and I just want to thank you again. Let's send some worship, God. Why don't we stand to our feet and let's worship. If you need prayer, come to the front. Good morning and welcome to Gateway Church News. Breaking news is we finally have our kids program. If you are sick to death of them during these school holidays, why don't you send them to Gateway Church? 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday for three days, we'll be starting our program. It'll be Narnia themed, there'll be fun activities, plenty to do. The last day we even have an excursion, so please if you're interested, see Josh or Tonya and please invite your friends. In further news, if you are interested in being part of our Foundations course for the fourth term, please see Pastor Jeremy. The Foundations course takes us through the foundations of Christianity and we learn about the basics of our faith. Many people would not know that we always have someone praying and fasting for our church. If that sounds like something you would like to be involved with or you would like to come on the roster to pray and fast, please see someone in leadership. Don't forget about our prayer wall in the cafe area. If you have a prayer request, please fill out a card and hang it up on the board. We have a prayer team that wants to pray for you. We also have on the other side a praise report. God does answer our prayers and we want to hear about your testimony. Justin, we have a parents room at the back of the auditorium. 
If your child is causing a distraction for you or other people, please feel free to use it. You can hear the sermon at all times and what's going on. You won't miss out on a thing. Breaking news, Gateway Church is now Adelaide West's campus for LifeWell Wellness Centre. If you would like more details or you want to make an appointment, please jump on the website. Here at Gateway, we believe that it's much more blessed to give than it is to receive. As a leadership, we want to thank everyone for your sacrificial, consistent and generous giving. Please look to the screens if you want, need the details for our bank account. Otherwise, we have the box in the main area. Thank you once again. Well, that is all we have time for here at Gateway Church News. Don't forget, we have a report coming up at 11 p.m. Other than that, good night and God bless.